Yeah, oh they being mad. Yeah, honestly man, I just feel bad. Wait, honestly I hope they feel that. Yeah, one look at me, they say that boy he different. I feel like I'm ready now. The presence of God is here. Are you ready for week two of Mad Love? If you didn't catch week one, if you didn't catch week one, I encourage you, check it on the podcast, check it on the YouTubes, check week one. I want to get right here into week two. I ended last week, and the last scripture I shared was 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. The apostle John, he said, you don't want to know why we love? We love because he first loved us. The reason we love is because God first loved. But that was just kind of the beginning, even though I ended the message with that, that's the beginning of the thought. We don't just love because he first loved us, but because he is love and because we were made in his image. We also love because it's not a matter of what we're doing, but a matter of who we are. The whole title of the message, if you didn't catch it, I'm giving away the punchline. You got to go catch it. But love is who we are. That's why we love. I want to follow up this week with what I feel is a very um, fresh, specific, um, timely message for our ministry. I believe that We Are One needs to hear this. If you're here tonight, it's not by accident. If you're watching later online or listening, it's not by accident. You're here because you really needed to hear this word tonight. I believe it's going to be a convicting word. If you follow Jesus, especially long enough, if you're like me, you're going to be convicted. If you don't know anything about Jesus, then you're going to hear the heart of Jesus probably in a different way than maybe you've either been able to or you have maybe in a little bit. The title of my message tonight is Love is the Only Way. Holy Spirit, we thank you so much for your presence tonight. I just speak to every distraction upon my mind, upon the minds of people in this room, upon anyone listening in this moment. We rebuke it in the name of Jesus, and we take the distraction, we take every thought, and we make it captive, we make it obedient to who Jesus is. I pray that there be a release of the freedom of love in this place. Not the love we see in movies, not the love we see in campaigns or, or marches or anything that we see in the world, but a love that first and only comes from you and a love that is who you are. God, quiet and still our hearts tonight so that we can hear and receive from you. We acknowledge that you are the Son of God. We acknowledge that you've come from the Father. We acknowledge that because of that, you are love. So we zone in on who you are tonight. We ask, Holy Spirit, through the name of Jesus, would you connect us to our Father in such a way that when we hear the Scriptures, it changes us from the inside out. We pray this in the awesome name of Jesus. Everybody says tonight, Amen. Y'all love Jesus. Amen. 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 It's going to be good tonight. I feel that, uh, I feel it's going to be something we need. I'm, I'm going to tell you right out of the gate. I really think you need to take notes in this message tonight. So if you're one of those people like, I don't really learn by taking notes. Well, then learn later when you reread the notes, because I feel like, I feel like if you just take in the moment right now, Moments are fleeting. You need to somehow mark what God is doing in your life tonight and be marked by it so that you can roll in it. So let me just talk about our ministry for a second. I think uh, We Are One is incredible. Not what we do, but as a collective group, as I look out at y'all, I walked in tonight and I saw y'all here and I thought, wow, I'm so blessed to be a part of your guys' lives and what God's doing here. I think our ministry is incredible. I think what God uses us for is incredible, and I think that we do a lot of things in the name of love. Um, we do huge outreaches. Um, we stretch ourselves to broken and lost people. We know that God loves us, therefore, you know, we love Him so much, therefore we love people so much. You think about some of the things we do. We raise money for missions. We put on one nights that are completely free for people to just come and see what the, the body of Christ and what the church is all about. 
We go do evangelism on the street. We like, whether it's raking leaves or whatever it is, like we go and just love people right on the street and tell them who Jesus is and pray with people. We give away clothes and food. We work hard every week. We have VIPs that show up here every week, and I don't take it for granted that every week somebody comes here and they say, I want to just maybe take a peek at what the We Are One Fam is all about. We work hard to treat them like the special people they are. I believe as a ministry... We give our best to love the world. I really do believe this. But my question is, you see how I was ramping all that? And I was talking us up for a second. My question is, why is it that we can put on huge outreaches, we can show love to complete strangers, but then we can go home and we treat the people closest to us like crap? Why is it that the people we say we love the most, we treat the worst? Why is it that we can take the time to talk to a a total, complete stranger, hear about all their life, their past, be there with their sin, take time for them, show them Jesus, but then we go home and we don't have patience for the people that we say we love the most? I told you it'd be convicting. You know, right after John shared that scripture, taught us that we love because God first loved us, He continues in the next verse in 1 John 4.20. And he says, Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. Whoa, Johnny boy, slow up. Hate? Like, that's a strong word. Hate? Look how he continues. He says, Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother or sister... Whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. I mean, this hits you. If we cannot love people with our visible eyes that we can see, how are we going to love a God that we can't see? And look at this word choice here. He said, hate hates a brother or sister. He's saying like, you can't be treating, and when it says brother and sister, it ain't talking about just like your blood brother and sister. It's talking about like the family of God, brothers and sisters of the faith. He's saying, you can't say you love Jesus. You can't say you love God and then say you hate somebody. He's like making it known here, you got two options, fight or die. No, he's joking. You got two options, love or hate. That's it. It's not like this pendulum where you kind of grab some other stuff along the way. It's literally love, hate. That's all it is. We kind of look, I think, a lot of times at stuff in between. I've talked to a lot of people, and, you know, they're they're in some sort of, like, troubled situation with somebody or whatever. They go, oh, man, I really dislike that person. You know, we know, like, we're not to say the word hate. The word hate, that's not nice. But we go, like, man, oh, I dislike them. This happened to me this week. Monday with a believer, and God just put me in a precarious situation, a scenario that was really difficult for me. It really stretched me. It really burdened me. That person frustrated me. And so I'm going off to sit. I'm just like, oh, man, I dislike this person. If I'm, and I, I think I even said, <laughs> I love, I do this sometimes. I don't know if y'all do this. Man, if I'm being honest right now, it's like, why do we give that lead in if I'm being honest? Aren't we going to just be honest anyways? Like, we're going to say how we feel anyways? But I was going, man, if I'm being honest, oh, I really dislike this person. And obviously my wife, the person she is, well, you don't understand the other side. And all these things I'm like. Okay, when you dislike somebody, do you really care to understand the other side? No, I like my side over here. I don't, I don't like them. And so I'm struggling, man. I'm, I'm struggling through this. And I, I read this passage of Scripture, and this really just spoke to me. John's not given options here for dislike. Dislike is not an option. He said, you either love or you hate. It's your options. And I was like, oh, man, God, why are you doing this to me on a Monday, and you want me to preach about this on a Wednesday? Because if I could be honest with you yet, I ain't ready to preach this. If I could be more honest with you, I don't think I'm ready to preach anything the Bible says because I ain't Jesus and I'm still trying to figure it out just like you are. 
Now, might I maybe be a little more advanced in some of the things because I've walked with God longer, and hopefully in my spiritual maturity, I've grown past some of you, but if I'm just being honest, I don't got this figured out. This is me on Monday, the Holy Spirit teaching me this, and now two days later, I have to talk to you about it. You follow this scripture, and it kind of begins to show us there is more expected of you if you call yourself a follower of Jesus Christ. There is a higher calling of love on your life. If you don't want that higher calling, don't follow Jesus. Now, again, obviously not following Jesus. There are some other things that go with that that you probably don't want to have to deal with, like, I don't know, H-E double hockey sticks and stuff like that. But if you're going to follow Jesus, there is a high call of love on your life. He's saying you got to walk in mad love even when you don't feel like it. And the Apostle Paul addresses this. Look at Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 to 14. He says, therefore, as God's chosen people, you see in this? Like, hey, the people of God, chosen people, holy, he says, dearly loved. He's saying you got to be different. What do you got to do? You got to clothe yourselves. Even when you don't feel like it, put on some compassion, put on some kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. And then he says, bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you have a grievance against somebody. Now look at this. He says, bear with one another. He's saying, deal with it. Just deal. Can I tell you at times, even with brothers and sisters in the faith, the best you can do is just deal with it at times. You just bear with it. You ain't really liking how it's, it, how it's coming together. You don't really feel the best about it. But you know if you got two options, love or hate, obviously we're called to the option of mad love, to love like Jesus would. You just got to bear with one another at times. You just got to deal with some of each other's like pathetic decisions that we make, some completely ignorant things that are said. How many, things, how many times, hands in the room, you just said something, you go, shoot, why did I even say that right now? Okay, that's everybody, Right? And you just got to love that person despite what they just said, and you just deal with it just like people would deal with you. And when he's digging into this thought of bearing with one another, what is he talking about? Really two ingredients, and he even addresses this in it. He says, put on some compassion, some kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. When you're going to bear with one another and you're going to deal with it, you got to be patient and you got to be humble. That's the main two things that I, in my life I've had to do. When I'm just like not really liking the outcome of what's happening, what somebody's doing to me. And obviously, I've probably done worse than most people, if I'm being honest. You have to be patient. Be like, hey, they don't got it figured out yet, just like I don't have. So I'm going to be patient until they figure it out. And also, I'm going to be humble right now, and I'm going to honor them above myself, and I'm going to believe that actually they do love me. They will learn this with Jesus. I'm going to be humble right now, and I'm not going to speak bad about them. I'm not going to hold an offense against them. I'm actually just going to bear with them right now. I'm going to deal because I love them so much because I know I'm called to love. I'm going to deal with it because they are going to figure it out. They're going to become mature. They are going to grow in Jesus. And then the Apostle Paul, he continues, and then it gets harder. He says, and forgive as the Lord forgave you. I don't even have to ask by show of hands when it's been difficult, when you don't feel like forgiving somebody. Forgive just as Jesus has forgiven you, he says. And over all these virtues, the number one he's asking you to do, if you're going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, he says, put on love. He's saying, clothe yourself in love. Why? Because love, it binds them all together in perfect unity. I want to really dig into this idea of mad love, not when it comes to the world and how we're called to love them like we talked about in part one, but mad love when it comes to the church, the body of Christ, the way we're called to treat one another. Mad love is a matter of unity. If you're going to walk in the mad love of Jesus, you're going to want to be unified at all costs, one with what we call the body of Christ. Why do we call it that? Um, I'm going to get into that in a second. 
first of all, we're going to read it out loud because it's the best scripture that God ever put in the Bible. And I want you to read it loud and clear, and I want you to memorize it. I want you to get it in your heart. Are you ready? It's John 17, 11. I love it. You're going to love it too. Here we go. It's on the screen. Say it with me. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I'm coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. I know you want to shout and get rowdy after that one. I know it. Hey, it's good every time. I've been reading that one since 2011 when I probably had read it maybe before then, but I felt like 2011 was the first time I'd ever read that scripture. So it was like, wow, just lift off the page. Next thing we know, here we are, 2020. It's still just as good. I love it. So Jesus is like bringing this perspective in because this is a prayer Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane before he's about to go on the cross. And you know what he was thinking about? Really two things. For God so loved the world that he was sent to accomplish this mission, love. And the second thing is, I hope that they're going to stay unified. And what he's praying is, Father, you know how like me and you are super like tight, one? I want them to have that too. So the way that we are one, I want them to be one as well. Jesus is praying this prayer, and he's really taking this idea of we are one, and he's breaking it down to this concept that we are one is all about many parts making up a whole. Can I just first tell you this, though? This, this thought's in my head here. Mad love starts with mad prayers. If you're not willing to pray mad prayers, you won't be willing to walk in mad love. I can tell you that because on Monday, I was mad frustrated is what I was. I was mad struggling. I was mad disliking. Remember? Not possible, but I, w I was mad. Anything but mad love. Do you know when stuff started changing? Do you know why I can come up here and preach? Because I wouldn't have come up here. I would have asked somebody else to preach if I still had that on my spirit. I, I just couldn't handle it. You know why? Because I started throwing up digging in with some mad prayers. Mad prayer changes things. And I, I, I had to go in my face and say, God, I need your forgiveness. God, help my thought process. God, help how, I, how, how I'm treating people right now. Lord, I started digging in with some mad prayers. That really changed the course of mad love for my life. That's a quick tip. We are one, though Jesus is praying. It's this concept of many parts making up a whole. If you go to the book of 1 Corinthians, that's where we're going to be for majority of the rest of this message. The apostle Paul is writing this letter, and he's addressing the church in Corinth with some of these issues of being one. Now, a couple of things I want to tell you. If you look at 1 and 2 Corinthians that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, if you look at many of Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, all these different letters that Paul wrote in the New Testament, 1 and 2 Corinthians, there's something about it that's just different than the rest of them. He, address, he goes about it and addresses things just differently. Now, the first thing you can take note of if, you, if you've ever read these or maybe if you go to read these, I'll tell you, is that in the other scriptures that we read, these other books like Philippians and stuff where he's writing these letters, in this case, the way he addresses the church is so much different because he's like opening up with this conversation of who Jesus is and sharing the gospel with them. But in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, he doesn't do that. He literally cuts all that out and he goes right to, this is your sin, this is what you're struggling with, this is what you need to fix, this is your problem. It's kind of like, whoa, Paul, you coming out of the gate. What's going on here? Why? So why is First and Second Corinthians different than the rest of them? Because he's going to dig into this big issue of, hey, y'all got to stay unified. You got some issues with this. You need to be one as the body of Christ. Why? Because see, Paul had lived with them for a year and a half. He knew them really well. So the other churches that he's writing to, he didn't know them really well. He's just writing to them. He's like, hey, you need to know about Jesus. It'd be like the random stranger that you walk up and tell about Jesus versus your best friend that you know really well and you can speak to some of their crap, right? You go, hey, you ain't being a good friend right now. Be nice to me, right? And you can like just tell them straight up where you ain't going to walk up to a complete stranger and say, hey, you're not being a good friend right now. Be nice to me. That, it, it doesn't translate the same way, okay? Always when I talk to Z. Like, he still is not figuring out no, and as well as he even knows me, this is actually hurting my point. I don't even know why I'm saying it, but I always look at him, I just say, be nice, and he kind of looks at me like, I can't understand what you're saying, and he just keeps doing stupid stuff, and he goes, and he bobs his head on stupid songs. Anyways, off track, let's go back on it. Here we go, mad love. What are we talking about? First thing in Corinthians, something like that. So the apostle Paul addresses them, and he's like, hey, I've been there for a year and a half. I know y'all. I know what you're struggling with. I know what the problems are. You need to do this. 
Why am I telling you this? Because this June, I will have pastored We Are One for nine years, okay? I've been around. I'm getting like a dinosaur. I'm a little bit ancient, okay? So thanks for that. But the reason I was telling you this is, listen, I'm not new on the block anymore. It's not like my first year where, like, I looked like one of the students. Like, you see this? I sort of basically almost can grow a full man's beard. I'm a man at this point, right? Okay? Um, I got gray hairs going through my head. Like, y'all have worn me out over the past nine years. The point I'm making is I know this ministry. God speaks to me about you. I know the people. I know the heart. So when God tells me to talk about something, I know to talk about it. This is what the Apostle Paul is doing. He's speaking to the Corinthians. He's saying, hey, I know y'all. I lived with you. I worked with you. I ate with you. I went to church with you. And now y'all are doing some of this stuff? This is crazy. Why y'all doing this? And so in the same way, it'd be me, Pastor Steve, Pastor Tyler, any of our pastoral team, we know you guys. So when we speak to you, we're trying to, in the same way that the Apostle Paul loved the Corinthian church, we're trying to say, hey, we're not doing this naively. We know you. We've known you for years. We've watched your life. We know what you're doing on social media. We know what you're doing at school. We know you come to church and you act one way and you go to school and you act a completely different way. We know you. We know you faking. We know you. This is what Paul's saying. Let me get back to the text. Not here. Not us. We wouldn't want it to relate to us for a second and be real. We know you. You get the point? So what I'm preaching tonight comes from a place just like the Apostle Paul where I want to warn us about disunity. I wonder why I would talk about that. Not because I believe we're in disunity, but guys, I feel something in my spirit that if you don't listen to me, we will be. And this name, we are one, it is not a name. It's an identity that God's given us to live up to. It's a calling that he's placed on our life. And I felt in my spirit for the last number of months that this message globally across the whole group needs to be heard. Not a couple people, not just a certain grade, not young ones or old ones. We need to hear this, that if we don't get this in our heart, this is a warning from the Holy Spirit tonight. I know you, okay? I know this ministry. God didn't give this to me randomly. For such a time as this, he finally said, it's time to talk about this. We have to fight for unity because we live in a world that's doing exact opposite. They're going one color uh, blue, one color red. Republicans, Democrats, this side, that side. They're, they're, the world is splitting down the middle. We can't live in either side, and we can't live in the middle. Where do we live? We live anywhere we are together. That's where we live. As long as we stay together, we can't divide on issues. We can't divide on topics. We can't divide on anything. We have to continually fight for unity. So that's where the heart of this sermon comes from tonight. I felt like I needed to give you context so you understand that I'm not saying we are disunified, but I felt the check in my spirit that if we don't get this in us, we will become disunified because I see a couple things that were on a, a certain course and a trajectory that there's enough people doing things and they're not treating this with enough seriousness to say, we are one. And for nine years, I've been fighting for that. For nine years, I've been believing for that. For nine years, I've been pastoring and loving and, and seeing what God can do as long as we stay united. And hey, we got two options. It's literally stay united or die because I ain't living dis, disunited. I'm not living in disunity or any of that stuff. So when he finally is setting up this idea of being one, of having a oneness with each other, he breaks it down in the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians. And he goes to chapter 12, verse 12, and what he does is he uses the human body as an illustration to break down a much bigger point of unity. So catch this, verse 12. He says, just as the body, the one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. It's an illustration of just as you can kind of get the human body, understand this is how the spiritual body works. Just as every part of the physical body is important, every part of the spiritual body is important. Apostle Paul goes on to say, he says, listen, if we were all just the eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If you're all just the ear, where would be the sense of smell? I want you to think about the complexity of the human body. Not just the external that is simple to see, but think about the complexity of the internal of the human body. You have this circulatory, the respiratory, you have the skeletal, you have the uh, digestive system, you have the nervous system all making up the human body, right? All of these different many parts that make us up. And he's bringing this illustration to us to say, hey, that's us. Look at verse 18 and 19. He says, but in fact... God has placed the parts in the body. Really get this, okay? This is God's doing. Who you are is God's doing. Like it? Don't like it? Nah. 
Deal with it. God's doing. In fact, God has done this. He's placed the parts in the body, every one of them, check it, just as he wanted them. You look like he wanted you to look. You act like he wanted you to act. Now, obviously, he wants to refine your character and stuff, but your personality, all that, it's just what he wanted. Your talents, just what he wanted. If you're tall, he wanted you tall. If you're short, sorry, I know it probably sucks, but he wanted you short, okay? I'm like right there in the mid-range, you know, 5'9", ain't too great, but I tell Sid, you can never wear heels around me, though, because she's, she's too tall for me, okay? So he continues, if there were all, if they were all one part, he says, where would the body be? If you were all just the nose, if you were all just the eye, if you are all just the finger, whatever it is, where would the body be? Understand this. God has not only made you exactly what he wanted you to be, but then he placed you in this body of we are one even more specifically because he knew that we needed you. We knew, he knew that if you weren't placed in this body, we would not be as the body of Christ, as we are one. We wouldn't be who God wanted us to be. Every part's unique. Every part is important. Every part is necessary to make up the body. Why am I going down on this winding rabbit trail? We're talking about mad love. We're talking about the body. Where are we going here? The point in which you genuinely love the body of Christ is the point in which you realize you're not the only part of the body. And a lot of people struggle with this thought because they kind of think, they're all that in a bag of chips. Uh, that's like an old phrase. I don't know if that's still popular today. Uh, we used to use it back in the day. Man, I'm getting old. I feel like the more I'm just up here tonight, I just feel like I'm getting older throughout the night. Okay, so I think a lot of people struggle with this idea because they're just like, well, I, I got it going on. I, I can do this. Or people on the flip side, they're kind of just like walking around like this. And the problem is whether you're head up or head down, you're focused so much on yourself that you're so only caught up in whether or not you're this or not that, or, and you're, it's all about you. So really, in your mind, there's one part. It's either all you're thinking out of, out of arrogance and all you're thinking out of insecurity, but you're only looking at one part of the body. You're not the whole body. You're just a single part of it. The point in which that you begin to deeply love other people is the point in which you come to this hard realization that the Lord has taught me and is teaching me. It's not all about you. Let me just say it one more time. I'm going to say it a lot slower. It's not all about you. It's not. And you live much of your life believing it is. You live much of your life fixated upon your part, thinking you're the part. No, you're, an, you're a part, not the part. You're a part, not the body. You're just a part. It's not all about you. Look at what he says in verse 21. He says, the I cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. Because every part is different and every part of the body has a purpose. Every part is necessary. And it all works together to make up what is called the body of Christ when we talk spiritually. And now this is like a, this is a physical metaphor, but you put it together spiritually, this is what God's talking about. Now, when I was going through vocal therapy, when I lost my voice uh, three years ago, whatever it was, I had to go to a, a massage therapist and work on certain muscles in my neck still to this day. Certain times they'll tighten up and my voice will just, right now I can even feel it. It just starts kind of going out a little bit. And I started learning some weird stuff, man. The body is connected in some weird ways. Like all these different muscles and different parts of the body, they all trigger one another. They're all connected. Like for instance, the head is connected to your big toe. Now do this with me. I'm going to show you like this. Make sure you can like kind of feel your toe and go like this and just move your head like this back and forth. Can you feel it in your big toe? No, you can't. I just want to make you all turn your heads right now. <laughs> but in terms of what it's doing, listen, when things are done to the head, it is doing things to your big toe. When things are done, done to your big toe, it is doing things to your head. Or your shoulder is connected to your knee. Your chest is connected to your calf. So technically, when you're doing like calf raises, you're technically doing chest workout as well. No, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. But your, your chest is, and here's my favorite. I remember when I was on the table, and Pastor Steve, I think he has a, a sermon out there. I don't know if it's on YouTube or what, but he, he preached about this as well. Same thing happened to me. And the moment when your massage therapist says, hey, squeeze your butt cheeks together, you start wondering what kind of massage parlor this is, okay? And uh, she goes, squeeze your butt cheeks together. And I'm kind of like, why do you want me to do that, you know? And she says, well, when you squeeze your butt cheeks together, 
It, actually, the butt is connected to the heel of your foot, your wrist, and your neck. And I need, she was working on my neck. So she goes, squeeze your butt cheeks together. And as I, she would actually literally put her fingers in here. It would hurt. And she would squeeze certain parts. She'd jam her fingers down in here to get the release. And I'd squeeze my butt cheeks together like this real tight. And then she'd work on something and she'd go, release. And I'd be like, oh, gosh. <laughs> this is for real, though. Every part of your physical body, it's connected and it's important because it's all connected. So it doesn't matter whether you're talking about the eye, the pinky toe, your belly button. It's important. Like, I don't want to go without my belly button. I know it's not that, like, pretty or anything, but I still want my belly button. God, give me a belly button, so I want to have my belly button, right? So, like, I don't think any of us are going to say, well, I don't really care if I have that. Now, I know there are certain parts of the body that we are able to live without, but that doesn't mean that God intended us to live without it. It doesn't mean that's how we were designed. And somewhere or another, God has connected the body. And in the same way physically we talk about this, as much as it's weird hearing like butt cheeks squeezing together and stuff, I don't know who wants to be the butt cheeks in the room of the body, but like the body's connected and this is how God talks about us in terms of the spiritual body of Jesus Christ. This is how he views it. Every part triggers the other part. Every part is connected. Every part matters. And God wants you to realize tonight that every single one of us is necessary to make up the body of Christ you're necessary, but when we talk about mad love, you have to also understand that other people are just as necessary. And the way you treat them matters because they're just as necessary as you are. You know, I want you to think about how significant, I talked about the respiratory and the circulatory systems and all this, how significant the internal parts of the body are. Think about this. Without their functions, all the external parts of the body, they don't work. If the internal parts the parts that are unseen, the parts that don't get the main stage. They ain't the hand doing what they got to do, okay? They ain't the head moving. They ain't, the, they ain't seen. They're just in the inside. But they're actually the ones that are making sure the outside parts can work. If you don't know where I'm going, I just want to lift up somebody in the room. Sometimes you introverted people, you behind the scenes people, you think you're lesser than some of the extroverted people. But can I just tell you tonight that without you, those other parts don't work. You might not be extroverted. You might just be the introverted. But what you're doing behind the scenes, what you're doing that maybe nobody else knows your gift, the way you're serving maybe when no one else can see it, actually what you're doing is enabling even somebody like me to stand up here and preach the gospel. If you didn't do your part, I couldn't do my part. Can I tell you very simply that some of the things that you're doing that no one else sees, it's literally enabling people that maybe they have a calling to dance and they have a calling to sing and things like that. And you spend your time worrying about what you can't do rather than saying, you know what? It's actually because I'm doing what I'm called to do that it's actually enabling them to do what they're calling to do. And I just felt like somebody needed to get that encouragement tonight because some of you are wrestling with this and you're just like, man, like, am I significant? Like, is, is what I'm doing, does it matter? Like, I know you're saying like every part's important, but I kind of feel like what I do looks so much less than what someone else does. I would just like to pose this. If we removed you from the equation, could someone else say, I'm just going to use myself up here as an example. Could I do what I'm called to do if you were removed? You might say, well, I, I, yeah, I think you still could. I don't know. Could I? Remove, you from, remove one prayer you've ever prayed for me from the equation. Could I do what I do? Remove one time that you gave to make him free. Could we do what we do? Remove one time that you invited somebody or you lifted your hands in worship. I think we... We don't give God through, you know, our, ourselves, God through ourselves enough credit for some of the things that we're doing, lifting up his name just through our worship. I don't think we give that enough credit. How many strongholds that we're breaking, how many walls we are shaking, how many things are moving just when you show up and worship every week. And you might look at it as insignificant. Well, I just, it's, it's what we do. We just kind of jump for a little bit and then we kind of got two options fight. And we just kind of like worship for a second and that, like that's all we do. No, it's so much bigger. What is shifting in the atmosphere that you can't see? What's the respiratory, the nervous, the skeletal below the surface that you can't even see that literally God is moving just on behalf of what you're doing? I think we discredit this a lot of times. We are so connected. Have you ever been walking in the dark and you stub your toe on, on like a piece of furniture or something in the dark? You know what I'm talking about? 
Some of you, you about lose your salvation when this happens. Some of y'all, some of y'all just try not to cuss. Like everything in you, you hit that tone and you go, oh, Father God, help me. Oh. But it's not just your toe that you stub. It's not just the toe that hurts. You stub that toe and it's like your whole body kind of shuts down for a second. You know what I'm saying? Look at the Apostle Paul addresses this, verse 26. This makes so much sense. Look at the connectivity of the spiritual body of Christ. He says, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. You might look at it just like a toe stub, but that activates something inside your mind, the whole body. In the same way, if one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. See, what the devil, the enemy of our souls, what his sole objective is, what he's working over time to do, is to try to get the parts of the body of Christ disunified. He wants us to be in disunity of one another. He wants us to be angry, frustrated with one each other. He wants us, especially when you're at a young age and nine times out of ten, most of the things you're saying are probably immature and stupid and you wish you could take them back, or at least that was me growing up. Um, and you said that and you go, oh, why did I say that? He loves that. But see, you know what he loves more? He loves when we won't go back to Colossians and just bear with one another for a second and say, I know they didn't mean that. I know that's not their heart. I know they're working on it. I know they might have had a bad day. I'm just going to actually be patient with them, humble, and I'm actually just going to keep having some mad love in this relationship because I know that if we disconnect and disunify, it hurts the whole body. Do you understand that some of y'all have, I know there's like probably pockets of friendships and stuff. If your friendship is in discord and this body, it hurts the whole body. You might just be thinking, well, me and my friends, just we got some crap we're figuring out like we're just like we all like the same boy and it's been really tough on us or whatever I don't know whatever it is right I don't know what it is and, and I, obviously I know there's drama you can go find that on YouTube as well um, I know there's drama and I know that stuff happens but the reality is guys when you don't deal with your drama when you don't live out some mad love it doesn't just hurt you and your friends it hurts all of us it hurts me it hurts every single one of us because we are the body of Christ and when the Apostle Paul's digging into all, into all these different thoughts, ultimately what he's trying to do is say, listen, the devil wants you so bad. He wants you so bad to be against each other. He wants you so bad to just live with assumptions. He wants you to just live thinking, okay, this person, they said this and they really meant this or they're thinking this and you don't even know what they're thinking but you're just assuming what they're thinking and you're living your life with all these assumptions and you're just thinking, I know this person probably is against me. They hate me. They're probably, against, they're probably saying this behind my back. They're probably this and that. And you're actually just twisting a bunch of junk in your mind that didn't even happen. But he loves getting you thinking with all these different assumptions because as long as you can be assuming about somebody, you won't be loving them. You won't be fighting for them. You won't be praying for them because they're actually the first person on your list you put over here and go, you ain't getting prayed for today, my brother. Because you're, honestly, guys, probably about 80% of the time, we're full of assumptions and it's not even true. It's like, it's not even happening. And I got some real life stuff the last two days that proves that even for me. So I'm speaking with something real fresh right here. The devil loves to get right in the middle of conversations that we just take maybe a little out of context or he, he loves when we start comparing with one another. And some of you are all like, oh, they get to be the eye. They have 20-20. I'm stuck with the freaking thumb over here. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Or some of you are all like, I'm the digestive track over here. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> and you, you feel like your job's crap. You know, you feel like, you feel like, though, what you're doing, you feel like it's, like, unimportant. And then over here, somebody, somebody gets to, like, rock the mouth or, you know, rocks a nice, shiny set of veneers or whatever it is. Like, you feel like somebody else and you start comparing. And so what you stop doing is being the part that God asked you to play because you're so focused on the part they're playing, you actually aren't even doing what you're supposed to do anymore. That's called diarrhea is what it's called. <laughs> Constipation, actually, that's what it's called. <laughs> Even worse. So you actually stop playing your part because you're so caught up in somebody else's part. The devil loves that. He loves it. Or maybe some of you, it's not even the devil, maybe you are the issue. Maybe some of you, it's not like, I think we're all the issue in the end. I think we all make assumptions and we all compare. But something that you 
I, I really want to speak to that you really got to watch, especially at a young age, is when you are so caught up in saying a lot of dumb stuff, you start gossiping. And you don't even know you're gossiping. And somebody goes, man, you're gossiping, right? No, I'm not gossiping. I'm just talking about them behind their back right now. <laughs> That's gossip. Oh, it is? I didn't know that. I don't know. Like, you start, like, you start saying people's name. I, I would, one thing I try to, my best, I'm, I'm not perfect, but I try to not focus on the person, but I try to focus on, like, what's happening. So, like, the issue and not the person. Because when you start bringing people into it and then their names, you start bringing their character into it, you start speaking bad about their character, then you're making assumptions. Next thing you know, you're comparing. Next thing you know, you're gossiping. And it all kind of compounds into one thing. But I think gossip is one of the quickest things that can divide the body of Christ. He said, she said, is the quickest thing that can divide it. You know how many people have gossiped about me or pastor or our pastoral team or this church. Some of the rumors and the gossip is insane. Pastor drives a Lamborghini. We got like dead, dead bodies in the basement. Like some crazy, <laughs> some crazy stuff that's been said about our church. Like absolutely crazy things. And like to us, we're like, well, no, like I know that's not true. But to the outside world, what are they thinking? Like I know somebody's mom in this room they actually came and checked out Gateway because the gossip was going so strong that people were saying the rumors were so heavy and people were bashing Gateway and the circle that they were in so much. They thought, I'm going to go check it out to see what they're talking about. I mean, this sounds like a show or something, you know what I mean? Like some of the stuff they're saying is crazy. Ethan Sock's mom, she's still coming to our church since then. <laughs> yeah, baby. But see, when it comes to the, that's, that's maybe some people, I, I don't know if they call themselves the body of Christ or not. Listen, even people gossiping, we're still called to love those people and call them the body. The first thing we like to do is be like, let's get you out of here, you're messing up our body. No, actually God's saying you should actually fight for those people because I still want them. And mad love requires a fight. And the devil so badly, he wants us to remain selfish. He wants us to remain prideful. And he wants us to, to dishonor people. Because as long as we can remain in that state, we aren't going to live up to what Colossians taught us, to live in perfect unity. Look at how the Apostle Paul addresses this idea of coming to perfect unity. I'm going to bring it back full circle, Colossians, to now 1 Corinthians, what Apostle Paul said, chapter 12, verses 27 to 31. I'm going to go on a quick rabbit trail. I'm going to make a point out of it, though. He said, now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Okay, thanks. We got that, Paul. Now here's where it gets different. He said, in God's place in the church, first of all, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? I'm going to stop right there for a second, and then I'll read the last phrase, and it'll bring the other. He's saying, listen, there's all these different gifts, all these different roles that I've placed for people to have in the body of Christ. And they're good. And they're important. And he even says, now eagerly desire the greater gifts. He's saying it's not wrong to want to be those things. But can everybody be this or that? No. Can you be a prophet? Can you be an apostle? Can you be a teacher? Yes, but you are, probably aren't called being an apostle, prophet, teacher, miracle worker, helper, God. Like, right? We're each called to pay and have a different part. But the problem is, somebody goes, oh, man, that's so cool. They lay their hands on people and they get healed. I wish I could do that. All that I can do is serve. Like, I literally set up chairs and I tear them down and I'm an intern and I clean. And, like, when they open their mouth, they give, like, a prophetic word and it's so cool. Or, man, they minister through this. Why can't I? And what we start doing is we start looking at each other's gifts. And that's why the Apostle Paul is saying, listen, now, eagerly desire the greater gifts, but he pauses for a moment. And he kind of breaks it down like, the gifts are good, the roles are good, but look at the next part in verse 31. He said, and yet, he's saying, but, let me tell you this, that's all good, but I will show you the most excellent way. He's saying, that's all good, but let me show you something better. And what he's doing, this is the last verse of chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, He's now leading into chapter 13. He's saying, you want to know what the most excellent way is? Is love. Why is love the most excellent way? It's because love 
is the only way. Now, 1 Corinthians 13, if you don't know, it's like one of the most famous wedding passages that has probably ever been used. And some of the weddings I've done, plenty of brides and grooms have asked me to read it. And you go through the whole thing. Here we are together. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 to 8. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. It is beautiful. It is. Even when you read it at a wedding, they're like crying. They're like, I love you. <laughs> it is. It is. It, it, these are beautiful words. But can I tell you, the Apostle Paul did not write this beautiful passage of Scripture for weddings. Like when he was writing to the Corinthian church, it wasn't in the context of marital love. He was writing it to remind the Corinthian church to remain in unity by loving one another. And he was going to break down, start, practice these things, live in these things, because these will keep you unified. He was reminding them that love is the only way. All the gifts are great. Everything's great. But love is the only way. That's why he starts it off in verse 1. He said, listen, if I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but do not have love, I'm a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor, and give my body to hardship that I may boast, and do not have love, I gain nothing. Do you see this if but language he has here? He's saying, if I have this, if I can do that, but if you can, if you have, if you will, but you don't have love, he's saying you have nothing. It's almost like a mathematical equation. He's saying everything minus love equals nothing. You could have every gift, you could possess all you want to have, you could have it all, but if you don't have love, you legitimately have nothing. You can accomplish much, achieve much, amount to much, but if you don't have love, you have nothing. And can I tell you that mad love is powerful? It is powerful. Because see, when we love, we actually empower people. When we love, we actually encourage people. When we take care of people, can I tell you something just huge, when, practical? When you invite people to things, if you know you're gonna have a, a bonfire or you know you're having like a Friday night hangout or whatever it is, and like there's these certain people that you see they never get invited, when you go out of your way and invite them to something, they're gonna feel like a million bucks. They're gonna feel like the best thing I'm planning. Like I can't, they noticed me? I didn't even know they knew I went to Weird One. They invited me to come to this. An invitation has so much power. That's why when we invite people to church, invite people to one night, invite people to conference, whatever it is, it's much bigger than them just showing up. The actual greatest moment was not when they got to conference. It was the moment when you invited them to show them mad love that you cared enough to even want them there. And we look at the payoff as when they actually get there. No, the payoff is that you took the time to actually notice them and invite them. And you look at this idea of mad love and the power of it. It's powerful. First Peter 4, 8, it talks about when we love each other above all. He says, love each other deeply. Why? Because love covers over a multitude of sins. It's not talking about love like a feeling. It's like love, like when you sacrifice, when you serve people, it covers a multitude of their sins. John talks about it in 1 John 4, 18. He says, perfect love drives out fear. And God gave me this thought. God's love is powerful. When he loves us, I told you, if you watch part one, I talked about when I'm sitting there and I'm scared to talk to this guy and pray for him and all that. And I felt like God's love rushed in. And it was like the perfect love. Like, Come on, fear be gone. Go do this. That's powerful. But you know what I think is more powerful is when you receive the love of God to a point that you give it to a point that you actually start loving people and driving their fear out. They're actually sitting there and they're like discouraged and they're fearful and they're worrying and they're cowarding and literally you start loving them and their fear just gets up and runs like a coward, just completely takes off and they're sitting there no longer with that fear, but now full of your love, which is his love. I think that's powerful. I think the moment when we step into these times to encourage people, love people, do you know what you're doing? You're reminding them who they are. 
whether they knew it or don't know it, you're reminding them, listen, I'm going to show you love. And it's kind of, they go like this and they go, love is who I am. And if love is who you are, fear cannot exist where love exists. So if they come to the reality of the identity of whose image they were created in, the image of God, the image of love, they can't fear because they kind of are awakened by this idea that this is who they are. The Apostle Paul, he ends with verse 13. And I love this. He said, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Why is love the greatest? Faith is powerful, hope, powerful. Why is love the greatest? Because see, in eternity, when we are in heaven with them, with Jesus, we won't need faith anymore. We're there. Our eyes will have been opened to everything that Jesus is, to all of his miracles, we won't have to believe for it anymore. We'll be given it. It will literally be placed upon us. You won't have to have this faith without seeing this 2020 thing we're striving for. When you get in heaven in all of his glory, you will see Jesus and you will see fully for the first time like Jesus. You won't need faith anymore. It, you, it won't need to be needed. So you get to heaven and you don't need faith. Then you get to heaven and all this expectation this anticipation, everything you've been hoping for. Listen, Jesus is what you've been hoping for and so much more. So when you get to heaven, you don't need hope anymore because it's literally all given to you. It's all revealed. Why is love the greatest? Because when you get there, 1 John 4, God is love. And as long as we are in his presence, we will be in the presence of love. So love is the one thing that will never fade. Love is the one thing that will never change. It is the greatest because faith will fade and hope will hurry away, but love will remain because it is who we are and it's who he is. You can't change this. So when the apostle Paul is breaking this thought down, he's including his thought, three people we've talked about. John, the apostle John taught us that love is who we are. Peter, that love covers sins, taught us that love is something now what we can do, what love does. Paul showed us that love is the most excellent way, but my favorite, my favorite person. I feel that Jesus best describes and teaches us why love is the only way. He's here in this moment. He's in, he's in John 13, and he paints us this image of love because he's there with his disciples and he's washing their dirty feet. They're nasty, I mean like sandal or barefoot they would walk, and he's washing their feet. This was such a humbling thing to do in this culture. And he's sacrificing of himself, and he's teaching them this moment of what love is. But understand that in this moment, you talk about bearing with one another. You talk about the body of Christ. You talk about loving each other in hard times. He's not only in this moment that was humbling enough, but in his mind, you know what he's realizing? Judas, the one whose feet I'm washing right now, he's about to betray me in the Garden of Gethsemane. Peter, the feet I'm about to wash right now, he's actually gonna walk away from me. He's gonna deny me three times and I'm gonna have to go back to the seashores to bring him back. He's recognizing that in this moment, the greatest thing I can teach them is not just the wash and the feet, but I am loving them even when I know they're gonna turn against me. I'm loving them even when I know that they're not gonna live up to everything they're saying. Peter's like, I will never deny you. And, and I know that. He's not going to live up to that. And I'm still loving him despite that. And then he slows up and he kind of pulls back from the moment and he looks at him. He said, okay, I got to teach you this. This is what he says. This, this is what should mark us to walk away from this message that love is the only way. John 13, 34 to 35. He said, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And catch this, this is why. By this, by this mad love, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The world needs to know the love of Jesus in us. But if we put on outreaches and we talk to them about Jesus and we invite them, yet we don't know how to love one another, they will look at us and they will be so confused He's saying, when you love each other, 
the world will actually see how much you love each other, how much you sacrifice for one another, how much you believe for one another, how much you cry over one another, how much you hurt when each other is going through stuff. The world will actually see that and say, I want that so bad. I want somebody to do that for me. I want somebody to love me like that. I want somebody to care for me like that because my family don't do that for me. My schoolmate, classmates don't do that for me. My workplace don't do that for me. I just want somebody to care as much as I'm seeing they care. The world will literally know us by our love for one another. They will see that we're followers of Jesus Christ. Because see, if we don't do this, it's going to turn into what Gandhi said. Gandhi said, I like your Christ. I don't like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. Love is the only way that we're known. Love is the only way that sins are covered. Love is the only way that fear is cast out. Love is the only way. This is mad love. Will you bow your heads, close your eyes with me tonight as we close? I know this is absolutely, this is a message for the house. This is a message for every single one of our hearts. But I just want to take a second, if either you're new here tonight, or if tonight you just know you are away from the love of God, I just want to take one quick second to allow you to respond to the crazy, ridiculous, mad love of Jesus that loved you and loves you. This is what you need to understand. That loved you and loves you at your worst. He didn't just love you before the cross when you were at your worst. He knew you would be at your worst, but he loves you currently when you're still caught in your worst. And if tonight you know you don't have a relationship with Jesus and you've not fully entered into the love of God or maybe you, maybe you did know him even years ago or whatever it was and you feel like now you don't even recognize yourself, much less recognize him. And you're saying you need to respond to the love of Jesus and give your whole life to him. If that's you, would you just lift your hand with me and say, I need to commit my whole life to Jesus. I need to ask for the forgiveness of my sins. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I got you, man. Thank you. Thank you. I got you. Thank you. You know, I don't think there's a single one of us. I think if I gave a call, I think everybody put their hand up that there's a single one of us that would say in some way, not say in some way that we're living up to what Jesus called us to do as the body of Christ. I think there's going to be something where we go, man, I'm, I'm off right there. And so what I want to do is I want to open up a time for us just to seek God and Look up at me actually for a second. I want to pray with the people that want to give their heart to Jesus. But what I pictured tonight was just the worship team kind of leading us and us just taking time wherever we are and just loving each other for a sec. Just stop them for a second, telling somebody, hey, I'm glad you're here. I value you. You're important. Maybe just stop them for a second and praying with somebody, asking somebody how they're legitimately doing. Because most of the time we're walking through it and our lives are so crazy. We're kind of going through, how you doing? Good. Me too. Good. And you kind of keep going and that's about as much as you get. But stopping for a second, I'd even encourage you if you really want to live in mad love, you don't even go to the people that are easy. You go find people that you don't even know and say, hey, I can't believe that I've never met you. We're, we're the same body. And I know I'm way up here as the ear and you're way down here as the toe, but I still can't believe I've never met you before. Or like, I know I've never met you because you're the digestive tract and you're inside, so I didn't, even, I didn't even see that you were there. But one way or another, I feel like we just need to take a second and like share mad love. Mad love becomes multiplied. Mad love becomes compounded. As you love madly, people receive that and they love even more madly. 
So would you just bow your heads? And for those in the room that you lifted your hand, I, I just want you to know that you're in a safe place. You're in a good place. This is family. This is home. There's not more expected of you than than we should. Like we're here to literally just make you feel in a place where you can receive Jesus and you can know that Jesus fully receives you. But across this place, would you just pray this with me for those that want to commit their hearts to Jesus. Say, Jesus, thank you for your mad love. Thank you for the cross because on it, your blood was shed so that I could be forgiven. Your love flowed down that cross so that I could walk passionately knowing in every part of me that I am loved, I am known, and my call in my life is to love and to know. I pray that you would teach me, Jesus, the areas of my life that are weak and that are in need of your wisdom, your forgiveness, your protection. So up for a second with me and say, whether it be my mind, my heart, how I'm treating my physical body, whatever it is, Jesus, show me how to live the way you've called me to and mad love. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks for checking us out. You can see any latest sermons here, or you can go to weareoneyouth.com, scroll to the very bottom, and there's a connect bar. And on that connect bar, I want you to just let us know how this sermon has impacted you. If you've made a personal decision for Jesus Christ, we want to know about it. We'd love to know your testimony. We'd love to know who you are and to really connect and be a part of the family with you. So if you can do that, we would love for that to happen. Or if you have any questions about upcoming events or more about who we are, browse our website. You can check that out there as well. If you liked what you heard today and you'd like to come on out as a part of our gathering on Wednesday nights, we encourage you to do that. We'd love to shake your hand. We'd love to hug you and welcome you to the family. Or you can check us out on social media and be a part of what's going on every day here at We Are One. God bless.